All right, so this is a Sudoku puzzle. Uh, it's a pretty simple idea that can get quite complicated if you're not used to it, right? So it's a nine by nine grid separated into nine three by three boxes. We solve it by placing the numbers one to nine exactly once in each column and each row and each three by three. That's a Sudoku, that's all it is. So I, I remember um, these first becoming quite popular in the UK when I was at university. So um, maybe 15, 15, oh goodness, 15, 20 years ago, somewhere in that space. Uh, now I've made myself feel very old. Uh, and a lot of newspapers would print them right next to the, the crossword puzzle. Um, and, and I always found them quite frustrating. I'll, I'll talk about why. Um, th th this one here uh, is graded as easy. So this is an easy Sudoku puzzle. Um, of the 81 cells, 38 cells are already filled in. They're called givens. Um, so that, that's about half the cells are already filled in. Um, most people, given the rules, can figure them out with a bit of timing and guessing. So I mean, uh, ju just looking at this, it takes about a second to note for me to notice that the bottom right is a three, um, just because the, the the two rows above it preclude a three going into the two spaces. So you can quite quickly work this out. So these were not the ones that frustrated me. Uh, this is this is quite easy. This one isn't. This is an expert level Sudoku. Um, so only twenty three cells are pre filled. It is much harder. There's an entire box in the middle that doesn't have any numbers at all. How do you fill this in? I thought it's pure witchcraft, and I gave up. So in the immortal words of Bart Simpson, I wasn't good at it right away, so I quit. Uh, the thing is, like, I, I didn't study. I didn't read up on any techniques. Uh, I, I didn't even try all that hard, uh, if I'm being honest. Uh, it just, I wasn't immediately good at it, so I just didn't do it. So that's what this talk is about. In some ways, it's about how you go from the left-hand side to the right-hand side. So my name is Gary Fleming. I'm an agile coach, uh, software developer. Um, and that right at the bottom there is my Twitter handle, at Gary Fleming. Um, so if you like the things I say here and you mistakenly think I will say other things that you like, that's the place I'm likely to say them. Um, so this talk's called TDD is my shame. Uh, so I'm hoping that you were expecting two things from this talk, uh, some TDD and some shame. There's going to be both. <laughs> and we're going to start with the latter. We are going to start by talking about shame. Um, so this, uh, this story starts uh, a meetup that I run. So it's a meetup uh, that runs in Glasgow. It's a software crafting meetup. Um, it's about writing good software, basically. Um, and don't worry, this is not a pitch for that meetup. Um, because I, I think it's pretty unlikely that most weeks uh, you're, you're going to make it, because um, it would be pretty early there or you know quite far. So a, a few years ago, we were running a session, and it was either mob programming or pair programming. I, I actually don't remember what, um, but there was an usual argument that broke out in one of the corners. Um, we don't know what it was. Um, by the time we kind of made over and kind of tried to see what was happening, it had dissipated, so we, we just kind of left it. Afterwards, uh, as we are prone to do here in Scotland, uh, we went to the pub, um, and uh, it was grey and miserable outside. So we we just kind of sat inside on in, in a, a horrible day. And one of the attendees, who I'll call Paul, um, seemed unusually perturbed. Um, when I asked him what was wrong, he mentioned that he was feeling some pretty severe imposter syndrome. He wasn't feeling good at all. Uh, he felt and looked deeply, deeply uncomfortable. Um, it was clear that it was him that had been in the argument. And the argument had made him realize something. He said to me, I'm a little ashamed, but I don't TDD as much as I think I should. And there's a lot there's a lot packed into that one little sentence. Or layers and nuance in meaning. I'm not as I don't do TDD as much as I think I should. That's uh that's a lot. So we we spent a little bit of time kind of talking about it. But since that night a few years ago, um, I've gone to a lot of conferences um, around the world, a lot of meetups, um, th things like this, gatherings like this. Um, and I'm a consultant, so I, I work between a lot of different companies. Um, so I, I get to meet developers of different backgrounds, different ages, different X, Y, and Z. Um, so when I can, I started asking them all pretty much the same question. Um, I can't remember if I asked anyone on this call 
uh, this question when I, I met you all, uh, met some of you last year. Do you do TDD? Do you? Um, so quite quick, quick show of hands, like put your hand up if you do TDD for most of your production code, like the, the majority of your production code is TDD. I'm not seeing any hands. So uh, if you've your camera off, you, <laughs> yeah, if you've your camera off, you don't want to say, um, I'll, I'm going to be looking at the chat window as well. So if you want to just say yes, no, whatever, I, I'm going to ask you questions as we go along. So feel free to shove your answers in there. So, I mean, the phrasing changes context shifts, but I've asked a ton of developers a question. And while no one does it 100% of the time, um, it's actually become really clear to me the number of people who do it is minuscule, like fraction of a percent, like a tiny, tiny, tiny number. And it appears to be getting smaller. You know, there are fewer, fewer people doing TDD. And that's kind of interesting. And probably worst of all, it irregularly is accompanied by shame. So when people say they don't do a TDD, they say things like shamefully no. Uh, they say, oh no, I, I really, I, I know I should, but I'll get to it one day. Um, and they don't, and they, 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 they often can't articulate why they're feeling that way about it, like why they feel like they should in such a way. So let, let's talk about that a little bit. So what is shame? Now, now, clearly, I am not a psychologist, I'm not a psychiatrist, I am not a therapist, so I'm going to tread pretty lightly here. Um, shame is rooted in vulnerability, uh, but manifests in, in many different ways. And a number of things can contribute to the experience of shame. Um, so one of the papers that I, I found, <coughs> excuse me, um, said that these are some of the kind of the more common ways that shame kind of manifests itself. So it can be about self-awareness. Um, like a, a simple social faux pas, like wearing something for a casual to a formal event. Yeah. Uh, sometimes it's looking for causation and come up short, so you blame yourself. That's sort of self blaming thing. Um, it can be breaching a, a sort of social, a, a kind of standard convention, like laughing unexpectedly at a funeral. It can be low self esteem, like directing things going wrong at yourself as a reflective action. Um, there's a great TED talk uh, by Brenny Brown, uh, a fantastic researcher. Um, it, it's worth watching the whole thing. It's called Listening to Shame. Uh, but I want to call attention to something she points out about how shame manifests uh, differently for men and women. Um, and, and it really does manifest differently for men and women. So she says uh, that for women, shame for women is a web of unobtainable, conflicting, competing expectations about who we're supposed to be, and it's a straitjacket. Now, I'm hoping that might resonate with uh, a few of you in the call. You know, we, we put such high societal expectations on women on in so many different directions that it is impossible. Like, it's literally impossible to meet them all. You, you cannot do it. For men, um, it's mostly just one thing. It's mostly just one thing. I mean, we're not talking all women or all men here, but for men, it's pretty much just one thing. Don't be weak. A whole bunch of societal damage has been done and continues to be done by the self-reinforcing idea that men mustn't ever show weakness. That, and that is the basis of toxic masculinity right there. That is a whole talk by itself. It's maybe a whole series of podcasts, uh, you know, a book, 10 books, whatever it is. Um, so I'm not going to focus on that. Um, but it's worth pointing out what the roots of a lot of shame in men and women are. So what, why, are, why are developers experience it when I just asked them a, a question about TDD uh, and, and why and it probably really is shame it's yet another thing for them that they don't do a reminder of their lack of perfection it's another way in which someone they perceive as better might perceive them as weak it is about society's expectations reflecting back in themselves so I want to start this talk by talking about shame uh, as I have but I also want to say look you're good enough Whatever else I say tonight, you are good enough. Um, whatever happens, you don't need to feel bad about not doing it. You're not better if you can do it. Do what you can. Um, learn what you can. If, if you feel like you've got time and you want to go and learn more about DD, if you can take on some of the stuff that I'm going to talk about, amazing. But fundamentally, you're already good enough. You have nothing to prove. Deep breath. <sighs> So this is an easy Sudoku. 
the strategy you use uh, that worked for me was very simple. Uh, you scan the grid, uh, looking for the only gaps a number could go in. So as I said earlier, this is the same one from the start. So you know, I, I would scan the bottom row for the threes and then notice that I could put a three uh, down the bottom right-hand corner. Um, I might also notice that in column two, row four, uh, a one has to go in there because the other ones stop it going anywhere else. You don't really need to think. It's a very easy thing to do. And if you do it over and over and over again, the number of spaces for numbers to go lowers, and you really don't need to do it now. So it's a very simple technique. So I spent a good while about this in this TDD talk, not talking about TDD. So let's talk about TDD. Um, there's a lot of places we could begin, but let's begin with what it is. Is it a te testing practice? No, it's not. Uh, if you go to any test conferences and start talking about TDD, they will have no clue what you're talking about. Incidentally, I'm doing that next week. I'm doing a talk called TDD for testers, uh, which is going to be interesting. I haven't written it yet, so I'm very excited to see what I'm going to say. Um, they're useful as an outcome. I mean, you know, tests are an outcome of doing TDD, and that is useful, but that's not really what they are. Is it a design strategy? Yeah, maybe. Maybe more we're getting a bit warmer. Um, is it a development practice? Uh, yeah, probably. So I, I like this quote by uh, Anthony, Anthony Marcano. Anthony Marcano? Forgive me, it's late. I'm not saying words properly. Um, I would say TDD is a software development practice. Design, coding, testing are all elements of software development. Uh, too often development is often synonymous with uh, writing code, which does the definition of the word of disservice. And I strongly agree with that. Um, it's harmfully narrow to think about development as just churning out code. It's not. Code is a liability. Uh, the more code you have, the more liability you have accrued. You want to do uh, what you can with as little as you can and ensure that the code you do write is well designed and well tested. And TDD is a, a mechanism for allowing that. It's an enabler for that kind of good code. It, it, it's also fair to say that there is actually no one thing called TDD, right? There really isn't a single practice that you would call TDD as much as we, we frame it that way. Um, it's a whole bunch of practices that kind of mush together. So Ron Jeffries, who's one of the Agile Manifesto signatories and uh, one of the developers of uh, test driven development, unit testing, and a bunch of other stuff, says that the ID, that's how IDs are. They're mushy. They are kind of like Play-Doh mixing up on top of each other. Um, I, I like this phrasing. So Liz Keogh, who's one of the creators of uh, BDD, quite a related practice in, in some people's heads, um, although we could argue about that as well. Uh, she describes TDD as an anchor term. So it's a useful term for searching for stuff. If if you want to go and Google for the, the uh, practices around TDD, the phrase TDD is going to help you. So it's a good anchor term that will help you go and find stuff. So. TDD is not unit testing, right? They are different practices. Um, but it helps if you understand unit testing first. So first of all, this is a question. Feel free to say in the chat or uh, put it put your mics on and say, what do you think a unit is? The answer, the actual answer, the definition, the, uh, the original, original definition is there isn't one. Um, there is no. Uh, definition of unit testing, and there never has been. So the people who created unit tests uh, and the idea disagreed with each other. So right from the very get-go, uh, there has never been a single idea for what a unit test is. So don't don't feel bad if you don't know. Um, the things that they did agree on, though, they did agree on a few things. So a unit test has to meet each of these criteria. It cannot speak to the database. It cannot speak to the network. And it cannot speak to the file system. So that is, there can be no I.O. operations uh, anywhere in a unit test. If it has I.O., it is not a unit test. Uh, and the reason for that is quite simple. is to make it fast, isolated, uh, reliable, deterministic, repeatable. Uh, and that's all because flaky unit tests are worse than no unit tests. You should be able to rely on your unit tests every single time. Uh, they also say you know it must be parallelizable, whether you actually parallelize it or not. So that's kind of the idea of being deterministic and isolated, uh, and it can't have any weird environments set up. You know you shouldn't have to depend on stuff outside the code, uh, like you know the system clock or you know something being installed. Um, 
beyond the, the, the core tools that make up your, your language or library. Um, I also quite like what Sandy Metz um, uh, said about it. So Sandy Metz uh, is probably my favorite person to write about uh, code full stop. Uh, her books are fantastic. So she wrote um, uh, the practical object oriented design in Ruby. I have put it away somewhere. Oh, there it is. Yeah, so this book here, um, practical object oriented design in Ruby. It does not matter if you do not uh, write a word of Ruby. It's still a fantastic book. Um, I I read it before I knew Ruby. I think um, it's very readable and and very clear about uh, what good code looks like. Um, so she she says these things like you know uh, uh, good tests should be thorough and that they are logical and complete. You know they cover the whole whole design space you're trying to cover. Uh, they're stable. So they don't break when underlying implementation details change without you changing that behavior. So it should be an intention that uh, caused that change. Uh, they're fast because they don't get run otherwise. And if they don't get run, why do you have them? And few. So you should, as much as they should be thorough, you should also have as few as you can possibly get away with. Uh, and that kind of speaks to fastness and stableness as well. So now we know what a unit test is. Uh, what, uh, what would we talk about? test first, test driven. So a lot of people think that test driven development is where you write the test at the start. And that is, again, not the case. Um, you do write parts of the test at the start, but just writing the test first won't, won't get you the design benefits that we hope for from TDD. Um, you, you need some some upfront thinking um, that's required. Um, but what you're what you're having to do, what you're actually wanting to do is get your your coding and testing entwined together to form a design loop, and that is very often embodied in this the red green refactor cycle, which I'm sure you've probably seen a variation of before, even if you don't actually do TDD. Um, but the idea is uh, that you start by expressing the thing you'd like the code to do that it doesn't currently do by writing a test. The what, not the how. The idea not the implementation. Um, so the basics, you first make it go red. Um, I've, I've got three ways it can go red here. First, you can write a failing assertion. So if you write an assertion that should fail, that would make it go red. Uh, an unexpected exception would make your, can make your test go red. And, but more fundamentally, and the thing that causes the loop to be smaller than a test is missing code. So if I start writing that I want to call a function and that function doesn't exist, that is a point to stop in the when I'm writing the test and go and write that piece of code, just enough of that piece of code to make me make it go green again, and then continue around the loop. Now, there is actually a fourth uh, one, um, but I completely forgot what it is. And I tried to find it in my notes when I was, I was teaching this in classrooms last year. Um, I can't find it. I have no idea. So if you can think of a fourth one, um, please do let me know. I've, it's gone. So um, yeah, we we write uh, the green part is just writing enough code to stop the red thing. That is it. So writing the the method signature can be just enough and no more. And then we move on to refactoring. So refactoring is uh, where we change the code without changing the functionality. Yeah. So. We are not uh, moving a whole bunch of stuff around and changing behavior. If you're in a refactoring stage, the behavior shouldn't change. So you should be able to refactor the code side without affecting the test, and you should be able to refactor the test side without affecting the codes. Um, an example of like what refactoring is, the name comes from that, right? So if, uh, if I was to multiply the numbers 5 and 291, uh, I get the number 1455. I can take that 291 and factor it into 397 and get the same output. Yeah, really all we're doing with code is the same. We're getting the same outputs when we refactor, despite moving the code around in different shape bits. Uh, I, I did accidentally, I normally go through multiple iterations of this, but uh, when I picked 291, it turns out I picked a, a number that very quickly becomes prime, uh, which doesn't help me. I mean, I could have gone back and changed it, but that felt like cheating. Okay, so common grapes that we see, um, you must see your test fail. So this great quote by Marco Rogers uh, illustrates it. Uh, one thing you must do is watch your test fail. 
if you write a piece of your test or finish writing all your test and it passes first time without you having to do it, change it very slightly to see it fail so that you know it's failing for the right reason and it's not just failing because you wrote it wrong. And it's really super important that you know that it failed for the reason that you think it fails. Um, the loop should be smaller than you think, especially if you're new to this. Um, the, the, the TDD loop um, for beginners is usually in the scale of like 10 minutes um, of writing a bit of a red, bit of green, bit of refactoring. For an experienced uh, TDD practitioner who is working on a problem that they know how to solve, it's about 10 seconds per step. So the entire loop's about 30 seconds. You, know, you go through it very, very fast. Um, and that's hard. That takes years of experience, years of practice, and being comfortable with the problem you're trying to solve. Um, so that, that's going to vary, but it's generally much, much smaller than people think. Um, and I think we've touched on this already. People sometimes think refactoring means rewriting. That is not the case. Uh, refactoring is not rewriting. You shouldn't change behavior. <laughs> and the one that I see very often, people forget to refactor entirely. They, they think their code is good enough um, and, and are so excited to get you know the next uh, red green dopamine hit that they, they just don't bother with the refactoring because it's not as satisfying to see something stay green. There, there's a real satisfaction in going red green, red green, red green, red green and winning. Also, I actually think this is a, the biggest problem I see with uh, TDD, especially when I work in groups. I, I do a lot of teaching of peer programming and mob programming. Um, Red green refactor is not enough to uh, help you. Um, there are other things you need. Uh, principally, especially if you're working in pairs or in mobs with other people where you're, you're going to be speaking to them. Um, I actually think you need to do two things before you get into the red green refactor cycle. You need to select the requirement you're working on. Because um, very often when people are working in pairs, they believe that they both know what the next logical step is. But unless they actually articulate it, they're trying to solve two very subtly different problems or two very obviously different problems sometimes. So it's clear, it's super important that you're clear on the exact requirement that you're trying to uh, uh, fulfill. And then name it. Like naming is hard, as we know in computing science. Um, uh, it was Phil Carlton that said the two hardest things in computing science are cache and validation and naming. And that is still true today. Um, naming stuff is very hard. But naming your tasks uh, is an invocation, it's a way of saying, this is the requirement really hard, like as long-winded as you need it to be, this is the requirement we're trying to get into. And selection and naming are the kind of outer loop for TDD for me. I have no idea why this skills here. That's very exciting. Another deep breath. So this is a medium Sudoku. Uh, to solve this, I might use some of the same tricks. So, uh, uh, the third row from bottom, the um, the threes in the left square on row seven. Yeah, so uh, column two. So that that's again same sort of elimination. Um, but that's only going to get you so far, and it's going to be slow. Um, as there are fewer of your givens, it'll take you longer and longer to spot stuff like that, and it might not work. Um, I, I might have to look at other things like uh, other techniques like the last remaining cell, um, where I fill in notes for every po every possibility in every square to see where a number only appears uh, in a row or column or box once. And then by elimination, it's the only place that it can appear. That's time consuming, but it's actually, if you get good at it, it's way faster than some of the other things you can do. Um, the interesting thing about that, I find, is that new technique is quite powerful. If you then go back and apply it to an easy technique, uh, I, I found that it would take my easy solve down from about 10 minutes to about five minutes. Uh, this was when I was still learning. Um, so you can take these new advanced techniques, more advanced techniques, and take them backwards. So part two, not now. So that's a basic to TDD, um, a starting point, and some of the common issues we see. Uh, I, I want to kind of continue in that theme. I want to talk about some of the uh, common issues people have with TDD and when you should maybe do it and when you maybe you should not do it, when you should not do TDD, um, because I don't think we should be dogmatic with this stuff. Even as a, an experienced practitioner who literally does talks online to people across the world about TDD, uh, I, I think it's important that we uh, do other things. So I'm curious, what issues do you have with TDD? Like why? Why don't you do it? 
I live in Angular World and I do a lot of UI work. So I'll usually pick very specific things that are very, very error prone, but doing TDD on everything is just not, yeah, it's just not realistic. Yeah, that, that, that's fair. I mean, TDD and uh, everything is it, not, it's not realistic. It's probably not a smart idea either. Um, and UI is definitely where it gets hard and we'll, we'll talk about that in a minute. So. Um, like I say, I am not dogmatic. Uh, if TDD is the wrong tool for the job, you shouldn't use it. Replace it with something else. Um, find, find some other way of getting that sort of certainty in the design, the thing that you're building. My, my biggest issue I see, though, is that developers don't really seem to replace it with anything. I mean, by, by all means, get ready and try something different. I, I don't care about it. It's just a tool. But mostly we don't. There's no haphazard. There, it's mostly haphazard design, unnecessary code, and maybe add some tests later. There's no practice. There's no. Uh, there's no foundational thing that uh, drives it. There's no driving dog uh, doctrine to what they're doing. So I mean, I, I kind of I would use this analogy, right? So imagine you uh, built a fence the same way that you do TDD, um, which is you know you uh, you chop up bits of wood, dig some holes start nailing the wood together and then start measuring the boundary. And then you start measuring the wood that you've already chopped up and started nailing together. And then it doesn't quite work because uh, there's a big hole in the fence because you didn't buy enough wood. And then you go back to the shop to buy more wood, but you don't really pay any attention to how much wood you should have got. You just buy some and then go and take it back and then try to patch it across and hope that that works. In the same way that uh, a lot of people's development practice isn't a practice, the way that that fence is built is also not practice. It's haphazard, it's random, and it's costly, it's error prone. Um, you're going to be building that fence twice, at least, at least twice. So a pretty common reaction we get is it's it's slow. It's a slower way of doing things. And I, I think Michael's probably actually right. You know, until you get the habit, it is slower. Um, and I have this handy graph uh, to show that. Um, which you know I've clearly spent a lot, a lot of time on. <laughs> spent thousands of dollars rendering this one. Uh, yeah, so uh, Virginia Satter uh, is a, a family therapist um, who, who does a lot on uh, introducing change, but her idea is kind of roughly translate any most forms of change. So I, I imagine that rather than uh, doing TDD, that your boss uh, said that the best way of increasing sales was to suddenly uh, suddenly write everything in French. And none of you speak French. Actually, Martin probably speaks French, don't you? That that yeah, she does. Okay. Uh, so imagine right now that the green line is your current sales, and the blue line is the projection of sales. If you uh, if you all suddenly start doing your stuff in in French, uh, the honest truth is, at the day that you introduce everyone speaks French, you're actually probably going to get this this part of the red line where it dips down. Yeah, that's probably what's going to happen. And the reason for that is really simple. You don't know French. It's going to take time and effort and practice to get good at it. You're, you're going to suck. And honestly, if you don't buy a book, or at the very least, or bring in an expert to help or go on a training course or do one of these other things to get expert advice, expert help, it might just fall off the bottom here. But if you, even if you do get those people, it's still going to go down. And very often we get to the bottom of that uh, curve somewhere on the downward trajectory and somebody goes, ah, this is too expensive. It's too costly. You can't possibly do this. Uh, abandon ship. Like, let's just go back to speaking English um, or American. Uh, and, and, you know, it never goes anywhere. Whereas, you know, if you, you stick with it, you learn. Eventually, hopefully, you realize the benefit it comes out of the curve. That's the idea. Um, there are also plenty of things when doing TD does not make sense. Um, I've been told more than once in my career uh, that people try to write tests for ID generated getters and setters. So much more common in the Java and C sharp worlds. But to be clear, like, if your code is that trivial, that it's a getter setter that's generated for you, don't test it. Like It's not going to help you. It's, it's going to hinder you at some point, and it's not going to help because it's trivial code. Uh, Ron, Ron Jeffries uh, kind of put up a decent post where he talks about the reasons, uh, the times he doesn't do it. Um, he doesn't do it when it's simple or throwaway. Yeah, if the code is absolutely trivial or throwaway, he doesn't bother. Um, so spiking code. If I'm spiking code, I, I'm not going to TDD it. I'm just going to write the code as fast as I can. Importantly, then, I'm going to delete the code 
and then hopefully write it properly with TDD once I've learned whatever it is I had to learn. He also says he doesn't do it when there isn't a decent tool at hand. So his, his example is he's writing, I mean, he's an old guy who's retired now, and he's writing a video games in Padilla on his iPad, uh, which is niche. And there really aren't any use, unit testing frameworks there, or there weren't, uh, but there actually are now. So he can actually start to do uh, TDD there. Um, where, where they would put it is visual. Uh, it's really hard to TDD visual things. Um, it just is. It is very, very difficult to do that. Um, because the way that stuff renders on screen, it's really easy for it to go wrong. I mean, there are there are tools you can use, but it, it's not worth your time. It basically, test everything that generates a visual output to make sure it's going to generate the right thing. The like the, the stuff that's actual code, but the actual output don't don't bother. It's not worth your time. And he also says, I, I think probably most tellingly, he doesn't do TDD when he can't think how he tests them. Yeah, he's been doing this a long time, and if he just can't think how he do it, he just you know doesn't beat himself up. He's good enough. He doesn't bother. He just goes on, which uh, <laughs> I think is really good. Um, uh, I don't know what's happening here. My computer froze for a second. Uh, so other reasons I, I I found and saw that um, maybe you prefer larger methods that are less focused. Maybe that, that's who you are as a programmer. I mean, cool. It's not who I am. Um, but if that's that's what you want to do, then go for it. Um, or you want to, you don't know how to keep the test look small. So if you don't know how to do that, fine. I mean, I'd go for a slightly bigger test look than the TDD uh, site, uh, and then you know think about how I drive it smaller later. Uh, or if you don't know how the system should behave, um, so th that's an increasingly common one that I see. So I've been working with some uh, AI and ML developers um, here and there, and they're like, "We can't possibly do that because we don't know how our our algorithms work." And I'm, I'm like, "Well, that's terrifying given what you do." Um, it's horrifying in some ways, given given what they do. But fair enough. Like actually trying to do TDD of predicted behavior beforehand, actually quite hard. Um, so I, I would, the only advice I can give them is isolate those parts from the rest of your system, so the predictive parts. Completely isolate them. Treat them as you would IO. Um, test the rest of your system, and then those other parts shove as good integration tests around it as you can. You know, if you're getting a, a an ML system that is going to try to recognize cats, which you know you should, uh, you know, send a bunch of cat pictures and then some dog pictures and make sure it's always producing the right things. Um, change that a little bit over time given the context. So this is a hard Sudoku. Um, and it's hard to see the subtle differences here from medium, but there are a fewer numbers still. And at this point, you might fill in notes for every square, like we, we said before, and use slightly different rules. Um, so the, the new rules that I would be trying to introduce here are things like uh, pairs. So if a number uh, only appears uh, in one one row, and you've got at least two of them, you can eliminate all, uh, sorry, yeah. If it appears only uh, in one row, you can eliminate all other uh, copies of the number in other boxes uh, in the same row. So pairs allow you to delete information elsewhere uh, if used properly. Same with triples in certain places. But you, you start using uh, information that isn't there more than information that is there. You're playing more with what you don't know more than what you do know. And you're using that to eliminate probability space or, or logic space. Um, whittling information down until there's, there is only one possible outcome, given that you use these eliminations. So, what now? So I, I wanted to make sure that uh, whoever ended up turning up tonight could take something away from it, um, whether it's kind of people who are uh, experiencing TD or people who aren't. Uh, so I, th this next section is a little more intermediate to advance. It's, to be fair, it's probably a little more intermediate. Um, a lot of the advanced stuff uh, I cut from the original version because it, it, it would take too long. Uh, and I found uh, during my research that no one does TDD, so it would be a waste of everyone's time. Um, so let's talk about this. So Kent Beck, uh, one of the early extreme programmer folk, um, wrote this, the four elements of simple design. Um, he said it, it's in order. Uh, and he says that uh, first, that it should pass the test. Like a, a good design passes the test, um, which, which hopefully is obvious. You know, if it doesn't pass the test, it probably isn't a good design. It, it reveals intention. 
So it's easy to understand. It's well named and communicated, right? So you, when you you write your words out there, it communicates. It sings to you something that's very clear and obvious and beautiful. Hopefully, um, th there is no duplication. Um, that you you know basically you don't repeat yourself, and I have a problem with that one. But uh, I'm going to let it slide because Ken Beck's smarter than I am. Um, uh, and fewest elements. So remove anything that doesn't serve the others. Uh, so that, that's kind of the, the keep it simple, stupid uh, principle. You know, remove stuff that you know you, you know you don't need and doesn't help you pass the test, reveal intention, or, or uh, remove duplication. But there's been a decent debate on the order of the middle two. So JB Rainsberger, who has done a bunch of TDD courses um, uh, and some really good, he did a really good talk on integration tests uh, a few years ago about how integration tests are a scam. It's, it's a fun talk. Go and uh, look up at some point. Um, he says, uh, his article has a great deal more detail than I'm going to go into. Uh, the, the basics are this, so um, remove duplication and improve names in small cycles. Right? If you can do that, you will have better code. If you can remove duplication and improve your names in small cycles more than the other things, you will end up with much better code. Now, as I said, I'd be very careful about uh, drying up your code too much. Um, I'd urge some caution about removing duplication too early, partly because I, I think short-term duplication is better than the wrong abstraction. Like, if you dry everything up, you can end up going down a very narrow path, uh, and it can end up being the wrong one. So I, I would say hold off on that a little bit, but improve your names. Improving your names in small cycles is very, very important. <clears throat> Excuse me. So every time I'm going around that TDD loop, I'm thinking hard about the appropriateness of, appropriateness of the names that I've used. Um, so very often, uh, especially uh, when I'm working with uh, Java folks, probably more than others, but some of this stuff creeps through uh, in the other spaces as well. Um, these are names that I see quite a bit. And to be clear, I, I don't think any of these names are particularly good most of the time. Um, when I see them in code bases. So object and instance is very, very abstract. Uh, and I see that quite often, like this this bar is an object. I'm like, wow, OK, cool. Uh, that doesn't tell me anything. It's an instance, great. Uh, but we, we then kind of see it in a, uh, the, the known verb pairings that we very often see in class names, with things like uh, process or processor. Like, I am the uh, data processor. I'm like, what does that tell me? Um, how do you process stuff? Why are you processing stuff? So process is far too abstract a name most of the time. And if you're if it's talking about a, a CPU process, uh, for that is what that is called. You know, if you hit PS in your command line, if you're talking about that kind of thing, cool, then it's appropriately named. But usually that's not the case. Uh, probably the one I hate the most though is manager. Um, we see that in almost every language uh, that you get a, a you know a, a cat manager or a, a a pet manager or you know, something like that. I hate the term manager. How, what are you managing? How are you managing it? Why are you managing that way? Are you actually two different things? More often than not, if you look at a manager class, it is doing two or more things. It's the kind of the read side and the right side of an interface, or it is the search side, or it is some other thing. Managers are places where uh, data interactions go to die. Um, they're a graveyard of, of abstractions being shoved together. Um, so if you see these kind of names, uh, maybe maybe think again. Maybe think again. Um, so what what do good names look like? Well, avoid unnecessary ambiguity. Yeah, if you don't need uh, if you don't need to. Uh, sorry, my screen's in a bit weird. Uh, so uh, uh, avoid unnecessary ambiguity. Um, if th something can be uh, can be more concrete and make it more concrete. You can always rename it later. I mean, if you're keeping it vague and open like manager so that you can add more stuff later, well, maybe reconsider that. But if that is appropriate, you can just change it later. Like that, that's totally fine. Um, they're just concise enough to convey the relevant information and no more. Uh, I'm sure if any of you worked in uh, Java or C Sharp, you've seen weird uh, weird long-winded class names and frameworks like an abstract bean post bean factory builder bean factory that is 
I mean, I, I don't know if it really does exist, but I'm pretty sure if I put that in a, the Spring document framework, it would be a real class somewhere deep in there, um, almost for sure. Um, and, and to be honest, like if that was a re if you were like really deep in the bills and that made sense to you in that context, cool, go with it. Um, I, I'm I'm fine with that. Um, but I would suspect that that's that that's not the case most of the time. Um, so concise, clear, relevant. Um. And use the shared share domain language as much as possible. So uh, very often we see developers making up words and domain words for, for things that they're building. Go and speak to someone in, in the business side or a product owner or, or a software, uh, a, a subject matter expert is a phrase I'm looking for. Go and speak to somebody who would know how to name the thing you're trying to model. Um, shared domain language is, is really pretty key and critical. Um, So what does it take to solve an expert level Sudoku puzzle like this one? It takes all the tools that we learned before and some rare specialized stuff that you only bring out every once in a while. Um, so they're, they've all got weird names and I, I'm not good enough at Sudoku to know, really explain them to you well. Um, I, I'm kind of at the point where I, I know kind of, I can recognize them and use them like Bowman's Bingo or the Y wing or the X wing or uh, there's one called Swordfish. Uh, there's all sorts of weird names that when you start seeing these patterns, you know that that's the right thing. But but really, it, it's not about those weird techniques that you pull out in edge cases. Um, for me, being able to be good at Sudoku is about uh, learning um, and studying, uh, seeking out new tools. I mean, as I said at the start, when I started trying them and I was really bad at them, um, I was bad at them because I hadn't tried to learn any. Um, I had just given up. So when I could, uh, I've been speak, seeking out uh, new new things like Y wings, X wings, whatever. A bit of time. Um, I, I'm thankful that I have a bit of time to go and spend every day learning this and putting some time in deliberate practice. So I deliberately practice uh, Sudoku every day. I try to work out in the morning, then do a Sudoku, and then go to work. And I, I realize there's absolute privilege in that um, that other people might might not have. And that's fine, right? If you can't do any of these things if you don't have the time, that's okay, you're good enough. And as I'm sure you've kind of guessed, the same things that would make you an expert in Sudoku are the things that would make you an expert in TDD. It's about learning, studying, spending a bit of time in it, seeking some new tools and deliberate practice. I, I've put in hundreds, if not thousands of hours of deliberate practice and being good at TDD. And it's only by doing that you really learn uh, and seeking out this information. And like I say, if you don't have the time, you're already good enough. You don't need uh, you don't need TDD to make you feel better about yourself. Like it, it's not gonna you're not you're gonna learn TDD and then think, think uh, all the other stuff goes away because that's not how the world works. Sadly, you're already good enough. Thank you.